Hey, mushroom friends, it's Anna McHugh. I'm hanging out in one of Raleigh's city parks next to a pretty ginormous weeping oak bracket fungus. This is um, a pseudo Inanatus dryadeus, and we don't have a official, you know, city mushroom for Raleigh, but this would be a pretty good candidate. Suffice it to say, there's a very loud soccer game going on behind me, so there's a guy who definitely, um, people in his life call him coach, who is involved, so if uh, you hear some uh, bellowing and hollering, that's why, and they're having a whale of a time. But I want to share some mushrooms with you that I found this week. It's been kind of busy, uh, so I've been stockpiling them and procrastinating making a video, but we've actually had some really nice rain in the last few days in the Raleigh area, and so we've seen a lot of these beautiful beautiful uh, mushrooms in the Amanita lavendula species group uh, come up and there's just a you know a mess of them and I want to talk about how to identify them because uh, the common name for them is the uh, false death cap or that's what a lot of people call them and so I want to give you a sense of like how to distinguish between them and an actual toxic mushroom. Um, I don't consume these mushrooms so I'm not going to really talk about that but this is you know oftentimes around uh, the end of the mushroom season we start to get a little bit desperate and so if you see an explosion of interesting mushrooms it's a really good time to study them and because the uh, diversity sort of drops off dramatically come December seeing these uh, beautiful mushrooms around is a good chance to learn about them all right so we have that I also have some wonderful hedgehog mushrooms to share with you uh, so we have wintertime hidden mushrooms which I'm a huge fan of we have some pink things and some red things, some bluets. Uh, so yeah, let's just dive right in. So I want to start with, um, again, this uh, really fun species group. And uh, so the Amanita genus has some really toxic mushrooms in it. Amanita phylloides is the mushroom that is sort of, people consider this to be uh, a look-alike. It doesn't really look super familiar um, to, or, you know, similar to me. Unfortunately, I don't have a specimen of Amanita phylloides to line up with, uh, you know, side by side. And to that point, in our area, Amanita phylloides, I don't see it nearly as much as I see this uh, species group of mushroom. So anyway, what you have is a cap and stem mushroom that is sort of a pale yellowish color. And sometimes you'll see tissue that, uh, you know, sticks to the top. That is universal veil tissue. So basically the mushroom comes up in this, uh, you know, little lump of tissue. And you'll see, let's see, let me find one that has perhaps a little more. See, it's oftentimes very scant. And actually, I think I may have, I think I may have rubbed off the one bit of universal veil tissue in my whole collection. So, you know, it's a little bit tacky. It's a very, very pale yellowish color. Uh, one of the books describes it as a green yellow, but my eyes personally on the green to yellow spectrum, I, um, I start to struggle. So like people who describe the color of their snot, I'm like, I am kind of lost on the yellow to green and what that means for your health. But anyway, to me, they look to be, uh, you know, a nice pale yellow. And um, Lavendula is uh, the uh, species epithet for one of the species in the group. And you can see a little bit of it here. It's a very common feature uh, when the weather is uh, cold with one of these mushrooms that you get a little bit of almost a lavender sort of staining color. And, um, you know, again, my understanding is that that is far more common when it's cold. Uh, this one, I don't think this is really counts as lavender, you know, particularly. And that's another thing that you'll see really commonly on these uh, buggers is, uh, you know, in addition to sometimes these little uh, sort of blooms or stains of a very pale uh, sort of lavender color, you'll also see these almost rusty orange uh, brown sort of streaks and spots. Okay, so that's what you have going on on the cap. It is not, um, it's like a consistent color as well. And so Amanita phylloides, the death cap, it tends to be a little more, not splotchy, but like inconsistently colored. So uh, sometimes you have an umbo, that's the little thing on the top, you know, this uh, little um, sort of 
elevated uh, situation. And uh, as far as your stem is concerned, you have a ring. And so this is just a you know little ring of tissue that um, is sort of a pale yellow, oftentimes sort of matching whatever the cap color is. And it does often rub off fairly easily. Like there's a, not a tremendous amount to it. And as time goes on, this has been around for a day or two, you can start to see it, it just, it, it lingers, but there's not like a nice big skirt. Um, and then below it, it is sort of a nondescript, like you don't have any features on this stem that are particularly um, outstanding. And uh, the thing that is really important with identifying this mushroom is the base. Okay, so this is the best specimen that I have. But basically what you have with a lot of Amanita mushrooms, so um, Amanita section Caesariae, so the Caesar mushrooms, there are a lot of really brightly colored edible mushrooms that are very common in our area. And also uh, Amanita phylloides, the death cap, and Amanita bisporogera, the destroying angel, and other, some other very toxic mushrooms in this uh, section, it's called section phylloideae. So it's like these highly toxic ones, but also the Caesar ones um, and other Amanitas too, have a big old cup of tissue at the base. So it's like a distinct cup of, um, you know, protective tissue. In the case of Amanita lavendula species group, what you have instead is sort of a attached rim here. And so like it's a little bit uh, cup-like and it sometimes can be very, uh, you know, um, deceptive. Like this is a good example. This is fully attached uh, and is like not really a distinct cup that you would be able to pull off and is only attached at the base. Uh, but sometimes the rim of the tissue here goes fairly far down. And so um, if you haven't seen one of these mushrooms in a while, it can be a little deceiving. So you look at this, you're like, oh, and you know, Amanita bisporogera, uh, the destroying angel, it is a very bright white mushroom, very, very dangerous. And uh, oftentimes the base of it is sort of, instead of a nice neat cup, it's like a little blobby cup. And so sometimes, uh, you know, what you have is a very similar looking base, but if you take it apart, what you'll see is that it is actually one continuous like bit of uh, mushroom tissue. It is not actually a distinct separate you know, separate shebang. So that's what you have going on with uh, this mushroom. It is non-toxic. Another thing that I guess I should, probably should have started with, these mushrooms smell really strongly in most cases of uh, like raw potato. And you do have to like crush them up uh, oftentimes to get that smell. But if you're familiar with the smell of raw taters, then uh, that is what you'll get off of Amanita lavendula species group. So we have uh, Amanita americitrina, uh, Amanita lavendula, and Amanita some uh, other one, I think it's Cornelius's hybrid. I don't know nearly enough about this to call it anything other than Amanita lavendula species group, but you know, it grows in cold weather, it has all of these features and the potato smell is really helpful as well. So, uh, and another thing that's really fun about the base here and why I keep fixating on this particular specimen is it has this sort of like split and chiseled uh, base. And so you can really see that it is not in fact uh, a vulva or a sac, you know, that, that is attached to the bottom there. So I rambled a little bit, but the long and short is that we do have some really toxic and really delicious mushrooms that have cups. This is non-toxic. I think some people, eat, I, well, I know that some people eat it, but I do not. Uh, but it doesn't have this, um, you know, cup type of thing going on in the face. All right, so let's move on to um, our winter hedgehog mushrooms because I absolutely adore hedgehogs. So we have a lot of uh, different mushrooms in the hiddenum genus. Uh, this is an edible that is, you know, it is my favorite. But uh, we have, I think, 17 in the eastern United States, and some of them fruit very late into the winter time. And so in the summer and the fall season, they're in subgenus Alba. So they're these like really white, uh, you know, species typically that I find. And when you damage them, they uh, turn orangey, sometimes very rapidly, sometimes not so much. But the ones that I find fruiting in the winter time, they'll, um, you know, fruit right underneath. Uh, oak trees and pine mix and let me see um wow i lost my knife oh that's ridiculous of course i lost my knife um 
Oh, nuts. Okay. Well, we're just gonna we're just gonna sally forth here. So basically, this mushroom is more of a uh, you know dark, creamy color, almost orangey. But this is not really stain per se. Uh, you know, like I picked this mushroom a couple of days ago, and it does sort of develop these uh, you know darker tones over time. But like when it came up, it was this color. So I don't know which specific species it is, uh, but you know, the thing that you want to know about hedgehog mushrooms is that they grow on the ground. They are mycorrhizal, meaning they grow in association with a tree or a plant partner. We have 17-ish of them, maybe more in the Eastern United States, but they're all edible and good. And they have these little uh, adorable little teeth on the bottom of them. And that's the way that you can identify them. And they're oftentimes sort of like lumpy, bumpy little dudes. And they're not as determinate, like they don't, have this sort of like I am mushroom and gestalt of like stem and cap and gills. They're like I'm a bumpy little toothy dude but um, they have a delightful flavor and in the winter time another thing that's really nice about them is that they don't have as much uh, bug damage sometimes. I think these got oh check it out. Here's one that again I picked a couple of days ago. In the summertime I rush these home and I try to eat them as rapidly as <laughs> as rapidly as possible. I eat them very promptly, um, you know, first of all, because I like them, but also if there are any uh, insects whatsoever, or any maggots, they will, uh, you know, devour the mushrooms very quickly. And so um, in the winter time, you tend to have a little bit less of that going on. So I was able to, co you know, collect a few handfuls of them and they are very sort of like rumply and warped looking on the top and, uh, you know, have these very beautiful little teeth underneath. So, uh, always a big fan of the hedgehog mushrooms. If you are brand spanking new to uh, wild mushroom foraging, I recommend getting to know them. That's one of the, I think, most approachable uh, mushrooms that we have. It isn't nearly as abundant, unfortunately, as like chanterelles or something similar, but it's a very great, you know, if they're not abundant, that's a great reason to explore more parts of the woods and then you can learn more mushrooms and people will think you're super cool. I'm gonna have a drink of water. All right, so let's do uh, bluets real quick. In the wintertime, we see a really rapid, uh, you know, diminishing number and also number of species of mushrooms. But bluets are a really wonderful, uh, you know, winter edible mushroom. Some people don't like them and I'm, I'm sort of like mood, de mood dependent. But anyway, there are some really wonderful ways to prepare bluets. The scientific name for them is uh, Clytosabe nuda. They are, uh, unlike a lot of the mushrooms, like these uh, hedgehogs I was just talking about who are, uh, you know, they're mycorrhizal, meaning they grow with a, a tree buddy. Um, uh, bluets are uh, wood decomposers or decomposers of leaf litter and uh, similar things. And so you'll often find them in like, um, you know, well, piles of leaf litter and wood chips and things like that. But you'll also find them growing on the forest floor. Like they'll just decompose, uh, you know, material kind of anywhere they are. So they grow on the ground, but, uh, you know, once you approach them and get to know them a little bit, you can come to recognize that they are in fact, uh, you know, not um, growing in association with anybody particularly. So what you have is a cap and stem mushroom. They are um, oftentimes more purpley when they're younger. So the thing with bluets, the can be kind of tricky is that as they age they can start to be sort of a tan brownish color and they start to look a little nondescript and you also start to stray into territory where you have more look-alikes and so you know if you're a beginner and you want to play it very safe uh, go with bluets that are like really, really, um, you know, enthusiastically purple, but you have, um, you know, these nice sort of purpley uh, pinkish gills underneath and they are separated from your uh, stem here, right? And so a lot of mushrooms will have, um, you know, they're either attached or, or not. And so they, uh, the fact that they're separated, that's one of the features that distinguishes a bluet. And they, uh, you know, again, um, have a sort of pinky color because their spores are a slightly uh, sort of pinky cream um, color. And so as they mature, they start to look that way. Your gills are tightly packed and then you have sort of um, a, a stem that is like a little bit streaky. Uh, sometimes when they're brand spanking new and very fresh, it's almost furry or flossy. Uh, and they very frequently, you'll see they have a slightly club-like base. And that's just where they, you know, uh, come up from their, uh, their 
well, the uh, substrate that they're growing in. And usually when you pick them, like if you just pluck them right up, you will come up with a good bit of nice sort of floofy purpley mycelium. Um, and so that's, that's a one way to, you know, uh, harvest actually the mycelium and you can tra transplant it. That's another thing. And I'm not a, a, you know, mushroom cultivation person at all. Like I just am, uh, well, I just haven't pursued it because mostly I'm lazy. Uh, but you know, this is, uh, Claytasa binuda is an edible mushroom that you can, you know, transplant from the wild without uh, too much difficulty. Another thing that I really like about these. So you have sort of a, a cap that is uh, nice and firm, a little bit tacky. It's not slimy or sticky. And sometimes you have almost like this margin of darker colored and oftentimes more purpley color around the edge of the cap. And that's one of the things that like if they do start to turn brown on the top, sometimes you'll still be able to see a good bit of purple right around the edge. On the inside, you have sort of a whitish flesh. And again, it's nice and dense and, and thick. So like you can cook bluets in um, all kinds of different ways, but they do take a good bit like they they don't fall apart on you they don't um they don't play you can you can treat them with a great deal of uh you know well enthusiasm i did find one that's really weird so sometimes you'll you'll find a mushroom this is a great example it was uh sort of pinned down underneath something so it's a bluet but it's like all kinds of smushed and it almost looked like a fairy ring mushroom but i was like oh but look at this uh nice lovely waffly margin and then uh discovered these uh you know neighbor mushrooms i'm like oh okay that's what we have going on here so bluets um again are really um good to look for in the winter time gosh we will see them taper off you know january february and march are kind of grim but they're always you know it's always worth looking for mushrooms even if there aren't many around all right so um let's talk next about hygrophorus russula i've been going on at some length but i really have found some mushrooms i wanted to share with you and i'm not going to make like five separate videos so um so if you're gone goodbye if you're still here hooray Hygrophorus russula is a beautiful pinky mushroom that we see uh that um the common name is the uh modeled wood a uh, pink modeled wood wax mushroom and that is a, a nice uh common name for it i uh think that oftentimes the scientific name is um you know it's confusing so it's hygrophorus russula hygrophorus is sort of a a waxy type of mushroom and uh, russula is a different genus of mushroom. So this, this right here is a russula, a nice uh, reddish sort of stumpy dude. And um, so hygrophorus russula is basically like, this is the, um, you know, waxy gilled mushroom that looks like a russula. So anyway, it is an edible. I haven't eaten it. Some people like it. Some people don't. I don't have an opinion, obviously, because I haven't eaten it. But anyway, uh, really, really gorgeous uh, spe species to find nonetheless. So you have this very uh, sort of pink, um, like almost uh, red wine streakiness, a little bit on the sort of uh, cool uh, white side of things as far as your gills. You also have a little bit of staining. Well, I don't know if it's staining so much as just like this pink streaking is sort of omnipresent uh, in various uh, degrees throughout the fruiting body. So you have whitish gills and they are, as I mentioned, kind of waxy. And, um, you know, the flesh itself has a little bit of this pink. So it's sort of like this, you know, pink white uh, melange. When you um, find them, they can be uh, sort of greasy or sticky on top. And um, again, I think that they're, they really do in some ways look like russulas when you approach them, especially because russula, this is a very, very common genus. Like you will find them all day, every day and into the winter time. And they're often really, really colorful. So russulas, there's many, many of them, hundreds of them. And uh, so, you know, this hygrophorus, I think, is like, oh, I'm kind of pinky and definitely could look like a russula from the top. And once you tip it over, you can also see these whitish gills. Like there is a resemblance. Uh, but, you know, this sort of streakiness and the, the um, greasiness is really helpful in um, determining what this mushroom is. So anyway, I was just delighted to find it because they are so, um, you know, well, dramatic and colorful. I felt like I had one other one that I wanted to show you. It was maybe even larger. It's with my knife, which I just found. <laughs> I'm doing great. All right. Well, 
suffice it to say, I really like pink and purple mushrooms, and uh, so and it's been a good time of year to catch a few of them, and I'm very pleased with that. All right, so in conclusion, I'm gonna talk about one last species for you. So this is um, the common name for this, which the, uh, the late and great Gary Linkov, who was a marvelous mycologist who served at the um, New York Botanical Gardens for many, many years and also authored the uh, Autobahn Field Guide for North American Mushrooms. He called this mushroom the Natsutake. So there is a very, very fancy edible mushroom called the Matsutake. And so, um, you know, it has this really pungent aroma. It is very, uh, you know, very treasured in Japanese uh, culture. And so they can be very expensive um, and they grow with pine. And we have uh, this mushroom that is the Natsutake because it looks in many ways like really, really similar to a Matsutake mushroom, but it isn't. It isn't pungent, it um, kind of smells like leaves uh, and, you know, semi-neutral. But, uh, you know, I understand that it is edible. I haven't tried it before, but it's a really fun mushroom to find. So the uh, best way to refer to it in terms of the um, scientific name is um, Tricholoma in uh, quotation marks, in quotation marks, Caligatum. And so, like, I don't think that th that is really an official or proper name for this mushroom as it occurs in um, North Carolina. But anyway, what you have is a mushroom that grows uh, in association, as I said, with pine and oftentimes in kind of sandy areas. And so you can see I picked these mushrooms from soil that was, uh, you know, pretty well drained and sandy, growing with loblolly. And you have um, these really beautiful sort of deep and um, soft like uh, gills and so sometimes gills are rubbery sometimes they're they're very crumbly but uh, Matsutake and this uh, you know Tricholoma caligatum has a similar just sort of like really uh, silky almost uh, and tightly packed gills that's sort of this creamy color you also have a very attractive uh, you know white um, under, you know, undersurface, but it is uh, sort of scaly and brown and uh, almost looks in some ways, uh, you know, scaled or like it, it's feathered um, to one degree or another. As you can see here, this is um, like if you, this were a Matsutake, what I have here would be, uh, you know, a um, commercially desirable specimen if, if you were, um, you know, in the, in the business of collecting uh, Matsutake for the market. And the reason for that is uh, it has a protective layer of tissue that is covering up the gills. And so when these mushrooms are still closed up, that's when Matsutake is the um, you know most desirable for market and uh, you know by the time the mushroom is fully mature you have this nice uh, you know basically naked stem that is white in color and then below it this scaly sort of brown remain of uh, you know this uh, veil that is broken loose and so um, if this were and Matsutake does occur in North Carolina. I have never found it, but um, if you do encounter it and you smell it, it is very, very pungent. It's like spicy and stinky and like all kinds of different, really complex aromas. Whereas if you smell this, you're like, oh, leaf pile. And I still love to find them though, because they're just, uh, they have a sort of stateliness to them and the unusual, uh, sort of bifurcation between the top of the stem and the area below where this ragged partial veil remains is just attractive to me and I think it's swell. Um, I am, oh, here, I found my knife and I found my largest hygrophorus russula before I ended. Actually, this is a really good example of why it looks like a russula. So, you know, russulas can sometimes get, a lot of times they get this sort of cratered appearance. And so when you come up on one of these, um, these mushrooms, they can look that way. But as you start to feel this waxiness, that's also more evident with this specimen, uh, you'll realize that you're dealing with uh, a different critter. Anyway, I hope you have a good rest of your December. I will tell you now, uh, Hygrophorus russula has, I would say, 70% of the smashability of a russula, and that's pretty good, because if russula is their um, really signature characteristic is that you can throw them at things and they just explode. So uh, we've done all of the mushroom th throwing that we can do for today, I think. Oh, no, I got one more, and it bounced.
All right, I'm gonna stop torturing you. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, week, whatever uh, increment of time you choose to divide my well wishes into.